Good morning, it is 11.30 a.m. and you know what that means. If you're a regular, that means it is time for First Chapter Fun. This is episode 51. We had episode 50 yesterday, today is episode 51, and we have a couple more until Friday, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. How is everyone doing? If this is the first time you've joined First Chapter Fun, well, You've got 50 episodes to catch up on. Um, this is the place where every day since March 17th, I have been reading the first chapter of a different book, not mine, but of my author friends, at 11.30 Eastern, both on Instagram Live down here and on Facebook Live up here. So we've got this dual thing going on, which is always fun because sometimes Facebook in particular um, sends little tech gremlins my way and boots me out. So if that happens, if I freeze, if your screen just drops me, don't worry, go get yourself a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or something and I will continue broadcasting on the platform that lets me and go back to the one that threw me out. Hopefully it won't happen, but sometimes when I say this, the phone just cuts out. So it's always an interesting experience, the trials and tribulations and perils of going live. Anyway, how is everyone? Oh dear, we just have a comment. It's too hot. I wish it was here. This weekend's supposed to be freezing for Mother's Day and my birthday, double trouble. So I'm not really looking forward to the weather part of it anyway. Um, Jennifer Chumba says her day's better now with, with you all. Oh, that's so nice. We have Anita who's joined. Uh, we have Amanda. We have so many people already. We have, we have Carl up on Facebook and Tracy and Michelle and Maria from Switzerland all the way. Bonjour, Maria. I hope everyone's well. So what do I have in store for you today? Well, today I'm going to read, and I know it's back to front on Facebook because it turns me green when I flip the screen. So that rhymed. That wasn't intentional, but it does. It makes me look like the witch from The Wizard of Oz. So until that's fixed, I'm afraid it's back to front. But here we are. This is today's book, Darling Rose Gold. So if you haven't heard of this, I don't know where you've been because, <laughs> because it's been everywhere and it is magic. So this is Darling Rose Gold, also known as, mm, let me just check. Um, I'm just trying to find what the title is in the UK. I think it's the upbringing, oh, the recovery of rose gold. I even had it highlighted and I couldn't see it. So in North America, it is Darling Rose Gold. In the UK, it's called The Recovery of Rose Gold and it is out now and it is absolutely brilliant. So um, let me tell you a little bit about Stephanie. I hope she will be joining because this book, did I tell you it was by Stephanie? I didn't, did I? Darling Rose Gold by Stephanie Rubble. I figured you just knew because it's so brilliant. So let me tell you a bit, little bit about Stephanie. I'm going to put my glasses on because, you know, I can't see otherwise. So <clears throat> Stephanie Rubble grew up in Chicago. Her mum helped her type and add computer graphics to her early stories, including one called How Mary Ann Got Lost at the Zoo. Spoiler alert, she didn't get eaten. Stephanie has lived in the UK for four years with her husband and dog, Moose Barwinkle. She has a bachelor's degree in strategic communication and an MFA from Emerson College and has had her short fiction published in Bellevue Literary Review. Before turning to fiction, she worked as a creative copywriter at various advertising agencies where she wrote and helped produce television and radio spots, print ads, billboards and digital campaigns for brands like Coors, McDonald's and Capital One. And Darling Rose Gold is her, brackets, absolutely fantastic debut novel, which is out now. And you can visit her at Stephanie Rubble, that's W-R-O-B-E-L dot com for more. Now, let me tell you about this book before I read the blurb. So actually, we were going to have uh, Stephanie and Samantha Bailey, who wrote Woman on the Edge, and I were going to have an event at a different drama books on 6th of April. And of course, because of COVID, different drama is in Burlington, um, the city next to the town next to the one where I live. And the, the event got cancelled because, well, COVID, you know, so I was really, really excited to read this, first of all, before we had the event, because I was going to moderate. But then 
um, I contacted Stephanie and said, well, you know, it's been cancelled, but how about I read for you on First Chapter Fun? And she said yes, and so did Simon & Schuster. So thank you to Stephanie and thank you to Simon & Schuster who allowed me to do this for her. I hope Stephanie will be able to join us. If not, as usual, I will save these videos both to Instagram, it'll go on my story for a bit, it'll be in my feed, but also on Facebook Live. So, back to uh, Darling Rose Gold. So let me read you some, some of the praise that has come in. Um, she's had sure to be one of the most unique books of the year of the new year. That was by Newsweek. She's had blurbs from Jilly McMillan, who I absolutely adore. She wrote The Nanny. That was last year's book, and it's, oh, it's just brilliant. J.P. Delaney, Lee Child, Liz Nugent, Amy Stewart, Wendy Walker, Sandy Jones, Samantha Downing, who's equally brilliant, C.J. Tudor. There's just so many more. And my favourite quote is the one, of course, on the cover um, from my literary inspiration, Lisa Jewell, who I have loved since I discovered her first book in 1999 uh, called Ralph's Party. And she says, an absolutely brilliant book, funny, dark, authentic, and a total page turner. I loved it. That was the quote from Lisa Jewell. And I love Lisa. And it was no surprise to me that I loved, loved this book. It's just, it's so dark. It's so compelling. Um, it's a real page turner. It is a cracker of a book. So let me read you. I'm going to get this out again. Let me read you the back cover copy or the blurb for this one. Oh, hold on, we have Carmen says this book is on my TBR list. Excited to hear the first chapter. Yes, yes, I'm excited to read it to you. So let me um, carry on then with the uh, the blurb for you. All right, here we go. This is Darling Rose Gold or The Recovery of Rose Gold in the UK, which is out now. For the first 18 years of her life, Rose Gold Watts believed she was seriously ill. She was allergic to everything used a wheelchair and practically lived at the hospital. Neighbours did all they could, holding fundraisers and offering shoulders to cry on. But no matter how many doctors, tests or surgeries, no one could figure out what was wrong with Rose Gold. Turns out her mum, Patty Watts, was just a really good liar. After serving five years in prison, Patty gets out with nowhere to go and begs her daughter to take her in. The entire community is shocked when Rose Gold says yes. Patty insists all she wants is to reconcile their differences. She says she's forgiven Rose Gold for turning her in and testifying against her. But Rose Gold knows her mother. Patty Watts always settles a score. Unfortunately for Patty, Rose Gold is no longer her weak little darling. And she's waited such a long time for her mother to come home. Oh, that just gave me goosebumps. It's such a cool book. There's the cover again. Darling Rose Gold. I wore pink for the occasion. Um, so let me now read you the first chapter. So this is I'm still eating my hair. <laughs> Curly hair. Ah, This is Darling Rose Gold by Stephanie Rubble. There we go. And this is chapter one. Patty. Day of release. My daughter didn't have to testify against me. She chose to. It's Rose Gold's fault I went to prison. But she's not the only one to blame. If we're pointing fingers, mine are aimed at the prosecutor and his overactive imagination. The gullible jury and the bloodthirsty reporters, they all clamoured for justice. What they wanted was a story. Get out your popcorn and bunch of crunch because, boy, did they write one. Once upon a time, they said, a wicked mother gave birth to a daughter. The daughter appeared to be very sick and had all sorts of things wrong with her. She had a feeding tube. Her hair fell out in clumps and she was so weak she needed a wheelchair to get around. For 18 years, no doctor could figure out what was wrong with her. Then along came two police officers to save the daughter. Lo and behold, the girl was perfectly healthy. The evil mother was the sick one. The prosecutor told everyone the mother had been poisoning her daughter for years. It was the mother's fault the girl couldn't stop vomiting and that she suffered from malnutrition. Aggravated 
child abuse, he called it. The mother had to be punished. After she was arrested, the press swooped in like vultures, eager to capitalise on a family being ripped apart. Their headlines screamed for the blood of Poisonous Patty, a 50-something master of manipulation. All the mother's friends fell for the lies. High horses were marched all over the land. Every lawyer, cop and neighbour was sure they were the girl's saviour. They put the mother in prison and threw away the key. Justice was served, and most of them lived happily ever after. The end. But where were the lawyers while the mother was scrubbing the girl's vomit out of the carpet for the thousandth time? Where were the cops when, while the mother poured over medical textbooks every night? Where were the neighbours when the little girl cried out for her mother before sunrise? Riddle me this. If I spent almost two decades abusing my daughter, why did she offer to pick me up today? Connolly approaches my cell at noon sharp, as promised. You ready, Watts? I scramble off my pop-tart of a bed and pull my scratchy khaki uniform taut. Yes, sir. I have become a woman who chirps. The pot-bellied warden pulls out a large ring of keys and whistles as he slides open my door. I am Connolly's favourite inmate. I pause at my celly's bed, not wanting to make a scene, but Alicia is already sitting against the wall, hugging her knees. She raises her eyes to mine and bursts into tears, looking much younger than twenty. Shh, shh. I bend down and wrap the girl in my arms. I try to sneak a peek at her bandaged wrists, but she catches me. Keep applying the ointment and changing those dressings. No infections, I say, wiggling my eyebrows at her. Alicia smiles, tears staining her face. She hiccups. Yes, Nurse Watts. I try not to preen. I was a certified nursing assistant for 12 years. Good girl. Diaz is going to walk the track with you today. 30 minutes. Doctor's orders. I smile back. Petting Alicia's hair, her hiccups have stopped. You'll write me? I nod, and you can call me whenever. Squeezing her hand, I stand again and head toward Connolly, who has been waiting patiently. I pause at the threshold and look back at Alicia, making a mental note to send her a letter when I get home. One hour at a time. Alicia waves shyly. Good luck out there. Connolly and I walk toward the intake and release I and R centre. My fellow inmates call out their farewells. Keep in touch, you hear? We'll miss you, Mama. Stay out of trouble, Skeeto! Short for Mosquito, a nickname given as an insult but taken as a compliment. Mosquitoes never give up. I give them my best Queen Elizabeth wave but refrain from blowing kisses. Best to take this seriously. Connolly and I keep walking. In the hallway, Stevens nearly ploughs me over. She bears an uncanny resemblance to a bulldog. Squat and stout, flapping jowls, known to drool on occasion. She grunts at me. Good riddance. Stevens was in charge until I got here. Never a proponent of the flies and honey approach. She is vinegar through and through. But brute force and scare tactics only get you so far. And they get you nowhere with a woman of my size. Usurping her was easy. I don't blame her for hating me. I wave my fingers at her coquettishly. Have a glorious life, Stevens. Don't poison any more little girls, she growls. Strangling her isn't an option, so I kill her with kindness instead. I smile, the epitome of serenity, and follow Connolly. The I and R centre is unremarkable. A long hallway with concrete floors, two white walls and holding rooms with thick glass windows. At the end of the hallway is a small office area with desks, computers and scanners. It could be a good accounting firm if all the accountants wore badges and guns. At the reception desk, the clerk's chair is turned toward the radio. A news programme plays. After a short break, the reporter says, we have the story of a baby boy gone missing in Indiana. That's next on WXAM. I haven't watched, listened to or read the news since my trial. The press destroyed my good name. Because of them, my daughter didn't speak to me for four years. I glare at the radio. 
The chair swivels toward me and I realise I know the clerk sitting in it. I privately refer to the bald and brawny man as Mr Clean. I met him five years ago. He flirted with me all day, asking what perfume I was wearing while I batted him away. I'd feigned breeziness, but internally I was seesawing between fury at the injustice of my verdict and fear over the next five years. I hadn't seen him again until now. Patty Watts, he says, turning off the radio. I nod. I remember you, he smiles. Mr. Clean pulls a form from his desk drawer, then disappears into the storage room. After a few minutes, he comes back with a small cardboard box. He hands me a piece of paper. Need you to look through the inventory list and sign at the bottom to confirm you're leaving with everything you brought in here. I open the box and glance through it before scribbling my signature. You can change back into your street clothes now, Mr. Clean says, gesturing to the bathroom and winking at me when Connolly isn't looking. I tip my head and shuffle away, clutching the cardboard box. In a stall, I rip off the jacket with Department of Corrections emblazoned across its back and dig into the box. After five years of prison food, my favourite pair of jeans, with the forgiving elastic in the waistband, is a little loose. I put on my Garfield t-shirt and a red sweatshirt embroidered with the initials of my community college, GCC. My old socks are stiff with sweat, but they're still better than the rough wool pairs I've been wearing. I pull on my white gym shorts and notice a final item at the bottom of the box. I pick up the heart-shaped locket and think about putting it in my pocket, but instead clasp it around my neck. Better for her to see me wearing her childhood gift. I leave the bathroom and hand the empty box back to Mr Clean. You take care of yourself, he winks again. Connolly and I walk down the fluorescent lit hallway of the admissions building toward the parking lot. Someone coming to pick you up, Watts? Yes, sir. My ride should be here soon. I'm careful not to say who my ride is. Though Rose Gold is 23 now, some people still imagine her as a sickly little girl. Some people would not be overjoyed to see us reunited. They don't care that I stayed up all night monitoring her vitals during every hospital stay. They don't know the depths of this mother's love. We stop at the door. My fingertips tingle as they reach for the push bar. Connolly scratches his Ditkesque moustache. That pierogi recipe was a real hit with my in-laws. I clasp my hands together. I told you it would be. Connolly hesitates. Martha was impressed. She didn't sleep on the couch last night. Baby step, sir. She's coming around. Keep reading that book. I've been coaching the warden on the five love languages for the past few months. Connolly smiles and looks lost for a second. Now, don't get all emotional, I joke, slapping his shoulder. He nods. Good luck out there, Patty. Let's not meet again, OK? That's the plan, I say. I watch him stride away, his clown-sized shoes smacking against the linoleum. He hefts his bulk into an office and closes the door behind him and then there's nothing left to face but a spooky silence. Just like that, the Illinois Department of Corrections is finished with me. I try to ignore the wild thumping in my chest. Pushing the door open, I walk outside into blinding sunlight, half expecting an alarm to sound or a red light to flash. But it really is that easy. Enter a building, leave a building. No one minds. I can go to a movie or church or the circus. I could get stuck in a thunderstorm without an umbrella or mugged at gunpoint. I am free and anything can happen to me. I stretch out my fingers and marvel at the breeze on this crisp November day. Shielding my eyes, I scan the parking lot for the old Chevy van, but it's a sea of sedans, no people. She should be here any minute now. I sit on the flimsy bench, scowling as the plastic protests under my weight. After several minutes of struggling to get comfortable, I stand, back to pacing. In the distance, my maroon van turns onto the single lane road that, leads, that leads to the admissions building. As it creeps closer, I do my best to flatten any frizzies and straighten my sweatshirt. I clear my throat like I'm about to speak, but all I do is stare. By the time the van reaches the parking lot, 
I can make out my little girl's narrow shoulders and blonde brown hair. I watch Rose Gold back into a parking spot. She turns off the engine and leans against the headrest. I picture her closing her eyes for a minute. The ends of her chest-length hair rise and fall with every unsuspecting breath. Rose Gold has wanted long hair since she was a little girl, and now she has it. I read somewhere the average person has a hundred thousand hairs on their head, more for blondes, fewer for redheads. I wonder how many strands it takes to fill a fist. I imagine pulling my daughter in for a warm embrace, twirling her locks through my fingers. I always told her she was better off with her head shaved. You're much less vulnerable that way. Nothing to grab hold of. Daughters never listen to their mothers. When she lifts her head, her eyes meet mine. She raises her arm and waves like the homecoming queen on a parade float. My own arm glides into the air and mirrors her excitement. I spot the outlines of a car seat in the van's second row. My grandson must be buckled in back there. I take a step off the curb toward my family. It's been almost 25 years since my last baby. In seconds, his tiny fingers will be wrapped around mine. <laughs> that was the first chapter of Darling Rose Gold by Stephanie Rubble. You must check this one out. It has done really well and I'm not surprised. It is absolutely phenomenal. Um, couldn't put it down, honestly. I kept wanting to read and not do anything else. So there you go. That was today's episode of First Chapter Fun. So let me tell you a couple of things that are happening um, tomorrow and Friday. So tomorrow's book is by Kate Moretti and it is In Her Bones, which is just brilliant. I love Kate. She also wrote, she wrote a number of books, but she also wrote The Blackbird Season, which I devoured and adored. Um, and it's, Kate's just, she just has a way with words and this book is brilliant. I can't wait for you to find out all about that one. Having said that, um, tomorrow I actually have, I have an appointment, a follow-up that I thought was going to be cancelled because of Covid and turns out I was wrong. Um, it's still going ahead and it clashes with first chapter fun. But fear not because the wonderful, fantastic, supremely talented Hank Philippi Ryan will be standing in for me. So she will be broadcasting on my Instagram and on my Facebook as usual, right where you are now. It just won't be me, it'll be Hank. Uh, and I'll be then back on Friday. So talking of Friday, so this is tomorrow, In Her Bones by Kate Moretti, phenomenal book, phenomenal author, I love her. Um, and on Friday, it is actually the last episode of first chapter fun as it stands now and that's all I'm going to say so tune in on Friday as well make sure you mark your calendars because there will be a special guest and there will be a surprise announcement so make sure you join us for first chapter fun both tomorrow and on Friday as well so I hope you enjoyed today's episode darling rose gold I cannot recommend it highly enough it's absolutely brilliant um, and I hope you will tune in tomorrow, same time, same place, for In Her Bones by the wonderful Kate Moretti. So that's it for today. I hope you have a lovely day, whatever it is you're getting up to. It's peak of the week. It's Wednesday. So, um, you know, we're half a week through this, this co another week of COVID madness. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I hope that you'll be able to tune in again tomorrow. So until then, please, as always... Stay safe, stay kind, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.